Hello, good evening. Welcome to the Liberty Church of Christ for our Sunday evening worship service at 6 p.m. We're so glad that you could join us for this evening's worship. If you don't mind, take a moment to uh, just hit the like button or maybe make a comment, I'm watching or I'm here or whatever you'd like to say so that we can know that you're here. Being worshiping together, I miss it. I miss seeing you guys. I miss seeing you out there. But I know you're out there. I know you're out there worshiping God. And, and, but it's just a little difficult for me sitting here looking at a box. But, uh, but I know you're there. But, but just a little comment, just a little like, maybe even hit the share button so that others can join in with our worship service. That would be wonderful. That's such a help, such an encouragement. And we like to encourage each other because I like to look at those little comments and, and comment back other than the comment that I made to my wife this morning. And, uh, well, that, that's another thing. You look that up and see what that was. But uh, we're just so glad that we are together worshiping God. Tonight, we're going to worship God and sing, and, and we're going to pray. We're going to have a message. I trust that you've already given of your means. That is a act of worship to God, and, and I trust that you've already taking the Lord's Supper. We did that this morning together. If you haven't had an opportunity to do that, then that video is still available right here on this page. You can go down and, and watch that and worship with communion if you haven't had an opportunity to take communion today. So tonight, we will be singing, we will be praying, we will be giving a short message, and I hope that we'll all be edified as well as worship our Creator. We are in this environment where we have to use this video, and I'm glad that we have this venue that we can get on Facebook and YouTube and all the different methods to get the word out and, and stay as together as possible, even though it's virtually together. But God understands. God knows. He knows that we need to be together. He knows that we need to feel safe. And in this day and time, sometimes we don't feel so safe. We are at a refuge right now. The refuge is at home. We are under orders to, you know, stay at home, stay at home. Uh, shelter in place is what it was called. Uh, take shelter. Shelter from what? The coronavirus. You might get COVID-19. And it's a very real problem. People are getting sick and, and, and even dying. So it is something that we should be concerned about. And, and it's good that we sheltered in place, took refuge in our homes. Now I think they're changing that to uh, it's safer at home. Safer at home. They're, they're kind of lifting that shelter in place order and making it more mild where they're just strongly urging you to stay at home. Why? Because it's safer at home. Safer from what? Safer from the enemy. Safer from the threat. We are taking refuge at home, and that's, that's a good thing. That's a wise thing, I suppose. We, we trust that our leaders are, are on top of this and watching this, and, and we're trying to do our part here at Liberty Church of Christ to shelter at home, safer at home, and using means like this. We're going to be talking about refuge today. Refuge. We need refuge. We need shelter. We need safety. And we're going to be talking about that from the Bible. Go ahead and get your Bibles and have it open to Joshua. Joshua chapter number 20. We're going to look at two other verses in uh, Exodus and also Numbers, but we're going to focus on Joshua chapter number 20. And we're going to see a shadow of the church. I love shadows in the Old Testament. I love the church. The church is God's plan. Uh, the gospel is God's plan to salvation. And when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, through baptism, then he adds us to the church. And that's where we find the shelter. That's where we find the safety. That's where we find the refuge. Looking forward to a lesson to teach us what's available in the church. Don't you want to be a part of the church? Of course. Let's go to God in prayer and begin our worship. 
Mighty God, thank you so much for allowing us some time to come together to worship you this evening on the first day of the week. God, we pray that you will bless our worship, help our worship to be done in such a way that you will accept it as a sweet-smelling savor that's coming up before your throne for the full intention that we intend for it to be. We're inadequate to be able to worship you properly. We're inadequate to be able to tell you how great you really are. But God, through the Holy Spirit, who is making intercession for us, who, who sees our internal groanings and can speak to you with words and groanings that we can't even utter, we approach your throne, God. Please bless us as we study from your word today. We pray, Father, that as we study, you will enlighten our eyes, you will enlighten our hearts and lift our spirits so that we can see how wonderful your church really is. God, be with us as we sing praises to you. We, we lift up your word and, 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 your, and your love in, in these songs of praises. and we, We're teaching one another through these songs and and we're admonishing one another through these songs, these hymns. Father, we pray that you will always bless us. And we do ask that you will forgive us for our sins. We often say things, think things, do things that are not in harmony with your great word. That's called sin. Sin is the transgression of your law, of your commandments. Please forgive us and help us to do better. It's in Jesus' name that we pray our prayer. Amen. The song that we've chosen to introduce our minds to the lesson is Near to the Heart of God. Near to the Heart of God. What better refuge is there to be near to the heart of God? What better place of shelter? What better place of safety is there? Let's sing. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin can not molest near to the heart of God. Oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold up to wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. There is a place of full release near to the heart of God, a place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, bless Redeemer, sent from the heart of God. Hold us to wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. Amen. Near to the heart of God, a place of refuge. The Old Testament is often put aside by a lot of people. They say, well, we're under the New Testament now. We don't need the Old Testament. Well, the New Testament even says that the Old Testament was written for our learning, that it was a, it's a schoolmaster, a teacher that brings us to Christ. When we study the Old Testament, now, it's true that we're not under the laws of the Old Testament. We don't have to abide by those laws in order to please God, but we do see things in the Old Testament that paints a picture of what God really intended for the salvation of humanity, Jesus Christ, his church, 
They're shadows in the Old Testament. They're reality in the New Testament. And we get to enjoy them. The New Testament is so much clearer. It can be clearer because of the light that the Old Testament sheds upon the New Testament. These shadows in the Old Testament teach us about the realities of the New Testament. And there are some shadows in the Old Testament concerning the church. Well, it's many shadows from Genesis to Malachi. You can see Jesus. You can see the church. You can see God's plan to save man to the blood. All there. But we're going to look tonight at another shadow of the church of Jesus Christ. The church is so important. The church is a place of refuge. When Moses led the folks out of Egypt way back in Exodus. God's power is the one that did it. God did it. He used Moses to do it. But he told Moses some laws to give to the people. These were just a bunch of Hebrew slaves that didn't know how to take care of themselves. They didn't know how to govern themselves. And God said, here's the way I want you to do it. And so he gave them many laws. There were 613 laws that he gave them to govern themselves in the Old Testament. And some people even see more, some see less, but by and large, 613. So that if they would apply these laws to their society, it'd be so much better. Well, these laws consist of ceremonial laws, which was how to worship God, how to perform the sacrifices, how to dress the priest, and who would be the priest. Then there was the moral laws, the moral laws, the, the laws that were just the difference between right and wrong, and good and bad. And then there were the civil laws. Now the civil laws are the laws that said, here's what happens if you steal. We're going to have this penalty or that penalty. Here's what's going to happen if you kidnap. You shouldn't kidnap. But if you do, here's what the society will do. And if your ox got out of the pen and, and went over and ate somebody's garden up, somebody's crops, ruined their crops, here's how to handle that among the owner of the ox and the owner of the crop. The, these were very practical laws to help govern themselves. There was a specific law about what if a man killed another man? Well, in Exodus chapter number 21, verse number 12, here's what one of those civil laws were. He that smiteth a man so that he die. If you hit a man or hurt a man or wound a man to the point that he dies, what is the law? Shall be surely put to death. If you kill somebody, you will be killed. It's a civil law, capital punishment. But what if you kill somebody, but you didn't mean to? Uh, I think our laws might call it manslaughter. You, you, you did something, and, and, and yes, you were at fault, but, but yet you didn't intend to kill the person. Or maybe you did it in self-defense. Maybe they tried to kill you, and and, and you try to defend yourself, and in doing so, you killed the other person. Should you die then? Well, here's what God said in Exodus 21, the very next verse, verse 13. And if a man lie not in wait, that means he didn't plan it. It wasn't premeditated murder for him when he killed that fellow. But God delivered him into his hand. Uh, maybe it was self-defense, and the guy attacked you, and, and you weren't lying in wait to kill the guy, but God delivered that guy into your hand. You, you killed him instead of him killing you. Something like that, self-defense. What about that? Then, here's what God's civil law was concerning that circumstance. I, God, will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. You don't have to worry about dying. You can have a place of safety, a place of shelter, a place of refuge. Because here's what's going to happen. The person you killed, even though it was not intentional, 
and even self-defense. They've got a brother, maybe. They've got a father. They've got family, a cousin, somebody that's going to take offense to the fact that you took their lives, even accidentally, and they may come after you. Well, you've got a place to go to be safe. And God said, I will appoint you a place. Now, this is when Moses was leading the folks out of Egypt, and they were wandering around in the wilderness for some 40 years before they actually go into Canaan land and to establish their properties and their communities and their government. Well, God said, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to give you a specific place. But I, I'm not telling you now. Why? You're not over there yet. You're not in Canaan land yet. You're still wandering in the wilderness. Then God inspired Moses to write numbers. There's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And so Moses sat down and wrote the book of Numbers in our Bible. So turn to Numbers. Go to chapter 25 or 35. Go to chapter 35 of Numbers and go down to verse number 6. Numbers 35, verse 6. They're getting closer to going into the land of Canaan. And, and they've been wandering in the wilderness for so many years. And, and Moses is pinning for the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Numbers chapter 35, verse number 6. Here's what he says. And among the cities which you shall give to the Levites, now each tribe, Levites is one of the tribes, 12 tribes out there, right? And when they go over into the land, uh, you're going to divide the land among the tribes. But the, but the Levites are going to have no specific land. They're going to live off of the tribes of the others. But he said, I'm going to appoint cities for among the Levites. And among those cities, here's what he says, there shall be six cities for refuge, which ye shall appoint to the manslayer. Maybe that's where we get our ma word manslaughter. He, he killed somebody and he's running. And he needs safety. He needs shelter. He needs security. So you're going to make six cities of refuge. He says that he may flee thither, and to them you shall add forty and two cities. There's going to be other cities around, but that there's going to be six cities of refuge. And they look it up on the internet, uh, type in six cities of refuge. Maybe that's that'll get you there. But you can find a map, and they were spread throughout. So if you needed a, a shelter, uh, you didn't have to go from the south all the way up north uh, or all the way down south. They were spread out so that you can go to the closest one. Now, why is that so important for our lesson? Go to Joshua, chapter number 20. This is when they were just about to go over and conquer the land. Moses is dead, and Joshua has taken over, and he's going to lead them over into the Canaan land, and he's going to say, don't forget about those six cities of refuge that you're going to need when you establish your society over there. Here's what he says in verse number one. The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, speak to the children of Israel, saying, here, Joshua, I want you to tell the children of Israel, what? Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses. Remember what I told Moses? That I would prepare a place for somebody who accidentally killed somebody. And Moses wrote about it again in Numbers, chapter 35, verse 6. Remember that? Well, when you go over there, you be sure to tell them to set those cities up. Skip to verse number 7 of Joshua, chapter number 20. And they appointed, and he begins to name the cities. From verse 7 to verse 8, all of those six cities of refuge were named. Now, I don't speak Hebrew, and I may mispronounce these names. The pronunciation of the names are not as important as the meaning of the name. When the Hebrews name something, whether it be their children, whether it be a city, whether it be a province, it usually took on a meaning 
They named it after something specific, some meaning. And they gave these names to these cities. God did. And when these names were given, I believe that God had a special reason for them to be named what they were named. Because we can see a shadow of the church in these names. As we look at these names, these six names, if you're taking notes, you can write one through six on your paper. You can write the Hebrew name of the city, and out beside it, you can write what that name meant. And then we're going to see how that name, the meaning of the name, is a shadow of the church, how that we find refuge in the church. Let's begin. Look at verse number seven. They appointed Kadesh, K-E-D-E-S-H. The word Kadesh means separate, set apart. It's separated. It's set apart. Folks, that's the church. The word for the church, the Greek word, is ekklesia. If you've been tuning in, you've heard me use that term several times. It's a special term. It's a good term. It's a Greek word, and it's the word for the church, ekklesia. And it literally means the called out group. They are called out from the world. They're set apart. They're separated. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 2, Paul, talking to the Corinthians, tells them, they being the church, they are sanctified in Christ Jesus. The word sanctified means to be set apart for a specific purpose, for a holy purpose. So Kadesh, one of the cities of refuge, is a term that we can see the shadow of the church of Jesus Christ. We're set apart. We're separated from the world. We're special. The second city, verse number seven continuing, is Shechem. If you write in your Bible, like I like to write in my Bible, I circle these. So that way your eye can go right to the word. So I circle Kadesh. And I circled the word Shechem, the second city. And Shechem is a Hebrew word, and it literally means shoulder or support. You know, sometimes when things get tough, you need a shoulder to cry on. You need someone that's strong that you can depend on and, and tell your problems to. Or maybe somebody says, we need to get this job done. Put your shoulder to the wheel. You know, really uh, get behind it. Strength. And the other word, shoulder, and support. The word support, you know what that means. You've got to have support. Well, listen to 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse 15. The church of the living God, comma, the pillar and ground, of the truth. When Paul was writing to Timothy there, he says, let me tell you about the church. The church is the pillar that is a support. A pillar is a column, not a pillow that you lay your head on. It's a pillar. It's a column. It's support beam. He said, it's the pillar and the ground. The ground is the foundation. If you don't get your foundation right, the whole house is going to come tumbling down. So you need a good foundation, and you need a good, sturdy pillar, support beam. The church is the foundation and the support of the truth. God has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet. He has no tongue but our tongue. We, the church, responsible for showing the world the truth. We're telling the world through our lives, through our words, through our actions, whatever it may be, we're telling them the truth. And we, the church, are the support of the truth. And we are supported. We are supported. We 
can gain the support that we need together, as some of these other words are going to bear out. Look at the third word, Hebron. Hebron is the third city of refuge. And the word Hebron literally means alliance and fellowship. An alliance. When the allies come together, they're allied, allied, and they are in fellowship. They work together for a common cause. Folks, the church is an alliance. It has fellowship among its members. Listen to Philippians chapter number 1, verses 3 through 5. You read that for yourself, but the, but the heart of that verse says, I thank my God, and he goes on to say, for your fellowship. I need your fellowship, Paul said to the Philippians. He was in jail when he wrote that. He said, I need your alliance. I need your, your fellowship. Acts chapter number 2 verse 41 says that after the, the Peter preached the first gospel sermon in Acts chapter number 2, baptized all those folks in Acts chapter number 2 verse 38, in verse 41 he goes on to say, the writer of Acts, Luke, says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. The church is a fellowship. We need the church. We need to be a part of the church. Look at the next city of refuge. Verse number 8 of Joshua 20. He says, on the other side of Jordan, uh, by Jericho there, eastward, they assigned Bezer. B-E-Z-E-R. Bezer literally means enclosure and fortress. When you need some help to be secure, you go to the fort. You need a fortress. You need an enclosure, a wall, so that nobody can get in and get you. Well, that's what the church is. It's a place of security. It's a place of safety. It's a shelter. It's a city of refuge. And it can protect us against all manner of evil. In fact, listen to what Jesus himself said. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, he says, I, Jesus, will build my church. And listen, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's nothing that can defeat the church. And when we are in alliance and in fellowship, and we are part of that church, we are secure. And nothing, not even the gates of hell, can defeat us. Look at the next one. Ramoth, R-A-M-O-T-H. And that Hebrew word means elevation or high place. Folks, the church of Jesus Christ is a high place. It's elevated. It's special. The Bible says in Acts chapter number 20, verse 28, that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. Now that's valuable. That's valuable. What did the church cost? It cost the blood of the Son of God. If you're a part of the church, and I'm a part of the church, we are the church, we are elevated. We are in high value. He called us the body of Christ. That's what we are. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32 and 33, Paul says, we're the body of Christ. Christ is the head of the body. He says in that same context, he's the head of the body, but we're the body. And he went on to say, we're the bride of Christ. We talked about that a little this morning in the Song of Solomon, how that the church is the bride of Christ. Don't tell me that we're not valuable. How valuable is your spouse? How valuable is your bride, men? How valuable is the church to Christ? We are elevated. We're in a high place, as Ramoth suggests. 
And then finally, the sixth city of res refuge is Golan, G-O-L-A-N. And Golan is the Hebrew word that means circle or passage. Circle or passage. The word circle could mean complete, and it does. When you make a circle, it is complete. There's no beginning, there's no end, it's complete. And the word passage is a way to something. So circle or passage, the Golan, is a, a complete way. And there's only one way to God. The Bible teaches us that. Jesus himself said that. In John 14, verse number 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father but by me. So we have to be in his body because the church is the body of Christ. That's how we're, we're in Christ. That's where all the spiritual blessings dwell is in Christ. So when we are baptized into Christ, God adds us to the church of Christ, and we're his body. We're in alliance. We're in fellowship. We're in support. We're in the fortress. We're separate and apart. And folks, we are in the complete way. The only way you can get to God is through Jesus Christ. And if you're not in the church of Jesus Christ, then there's no way to get to the Father. There's no way to get to heaven. God will add you to the church. Acts 2, verse 47. God adds to the church daily, such as are being saved. So as we are being baptized for the remission of our sins after having com confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, and, and we've repented of our sins, we're so sorry for them, we want to turn our life around. So we, we surrender to God in baptism to Christ, and, and we follow that that form of doctrine, the death, the burial, the resurrection, we rise to walk a new life. Folks, we're in the church. We're in the church. We're set apart. We have support. We are the support. We have alliance and fellowship. We're in the security, the fortress, the enclosure. We're elevated. We're special. And we are in Christ which is the complete way to God. Really appreciate you so much for being with us tonight in our worship. Don't forget that on Wednesday night at 7 p.m., Lord willing, we'll be back here on this page, and we will be studying a Bible study. So have your Bible ready, have your notes ready, and join us here on Wednesday night at the Liberty Church of Christ, 7 p.m. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this evening.